Okay, good morning. Sorry about that. Welcome to the third week of our series, When God Seems Late. God Seems Late. My, <laughs> get it? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll be here all morning. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor here at The Gathering. Man, we are so glad that you guys are here today. This, this, is, uh, this, is, this has been a great series for us. We're doing this series called When God Doesn't Make Sense. And truth be told, this is a difficult thing to talk about. These are some of the parts of God that make us a little uncomfortable in a conversational setting. And so we've been spending a few weeks here talking about just that, when God doesn't make sense. And today we're talking about when God seems late. We get a little bit uncomfortable when somebody's late, don't we? I mean, as a culture, we just don't like waiting. I bet that, that I was probably two seconds that I waited to come out here this morning. It felt a little bit like an eternity, didn't it? There was just this blank. It was awkward. There was nobody on stage, and we just started to get a little antsy. We always get a little bit of antsy when we have to wait for someone. You know, if we're sitting at a stoplight, and there is a person in front of us, and that light turned green a fraction of a second ago, and they're not moving yet, we're all about that horn, aren't we? We're like, get out of the way, you're making me late. We hate waiting when we're at like the doctor's office, or the post office, or at the front office for the school. We, we can't stand waiting more than a minute or two without pulling out our smartphones and getting on Instagram. I mean, what did people do when they were waiting before smartphones? I can't even remember. I think you just sat there and stared at a wall or something. People had magazines in the office that you would read from like three years ago. You'd read an interesting article about uh, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston's relationship falling apart. You know, I mean, I mean, the, 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 what did we do? I challenge you next time you have to wait 10 minutes not to pull out your phone. See what happens. I don't know. I can, I've never done it. I can't imagine what you might what you might experience. I mean, we hate waiting for, for anything. We, I actually used to be pretty late, and this is one of the things we hate the most. I used to be kind of a late person. The, the kind of my friends like anticipated that John Mark was just going to show up a little bit later than we wanted him to. And a lot of times they would get impatient, and they would text me and, or call me and say, Hey, man, where are you at? What, what's going on? Why, are you, why, why aren't you? Are, have you left? Where are you? Are you on the interstate? Are you almost here? And I'll be like, Oh, yeah, I'm on my way. I'm on my way which meant that I had just put my pants on and that I was about to make myself a snack and then I would get in the car and actually be on my way. Do you guys have a friend like this and you just know that when they say they're on their way that that means they're going to leave in 10 to 15 minutes? That's not what on your way means. If that's you this morning, that is not what on my way means. On my way means you're actually on your way. When I was in college, I had a friend who was the latest person I've ever met in my entire life. We were leaving to go to this cabin one spring break my freshman year, and we had told everybody we're going to meet up at noon to leave to go to this cabin. We're all going to ride together. And my friend said, got it, noon, I will be there. Well, 12.30 rolls around, we're waiting on him, and all of a sudden we see him driving the campus golf cart around, giving a campus tour that he had volunteered for 10 minutes ago. And we're like, we're like, Andy, same as Andy. I'm not going to tell you any more details than that. I'm like, Andy, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just going to give this campus tour, take another 30 minutes, and then I'll be ready to go. I've just got to pack. And we're like, you got to be kidding me because this guy, man, we hate waiting. We hate waiting as a culture. It makes us crazy. We are the most impatient culture, I think, there ever has been. And so it makes sense that we get very impatient when we have to wait on God. Waiting on God makes us even more uncomfortable because he's God. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. It feels like there's no excuse for him. He invented time. He manages time. Why can't he show up in the time that I need him to show up? Can't he do that if he's God? And, and, and we just want to cry out, you know, that this is something that's distraught in my life. Why can't God just do something about it? And why doesn't he do something about it right now? So what are you waiting for God to do? Maybe some of you are waiting to get pregnant. You know, when Rael and I wanted to have our first child, we were ready right then. I remember we made the decision. Uh, we'd already been married three or four years at the time, somewhere around there. I should know the exact number probably, but... We were married about four years and had decided we were ready to have a kid. And uh, when we decided we were ready, we were ready. 
I mean, we just kind of expected that would be it. We would have a kid the next day somehow, that the whole nine-month process was something we could skip. But we kind of started making the names, and we started planning for it, and we knew that, that, that you know, we would be pregnant soon. And so we started to plan different things like work schedules and future plans and get the room ready and what kind of stuff do we need to buy? What's the budget look like for this? And started doing all this, except then that next month came around, and I fully expected to see the two pink lines on that pregnancy test, and it just didn't happen. And then I remember the next month thinking, well, you know, these things can take a little bit of time. Sometimes it can take a little while to get pregnant. No big deal. It's been a full 60 days. I think at this point we're safe that this will happen. And I remember the next month it didn't happen again. And I started to think, huh, what's going on here? Then another month passed and another month passed and another month passed. And I remember the frustration that I felt in those moments because this was something that was so out of our control, surely it must be in God's control. Surely something like this must be in God's control. And surely we were following his will. Surely he wanted us to have a kid. He thought I would be a great dad. And so why wasn't this happening? Some of us have been there. Some of us have waited month after month after month after month. And then it turns into years and the pregnancy tests are still coming up negative and then the doctor's appointments come and then the expensive treatments and you're still waiting and you're wondering where is God in this where is God in this why doesn't he show up in my life and all the while you're on Instagram you're on Facebook and there's all these cute 30 second video pregnancy announcements that you hate you know and and then all of a sudden you start to feel the pain that comes with this waiting. Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe you've been through miscarriage and you're, you're wondering if it even is a possible and the pain and the loss that you've experienced starts to really set into an anger and a discomfort with God. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's financial. Maybe you are just waiting to be in, a, in the financial place that you feel like you should be. You know, someone, someone in their 30s, you feel like you should have the savings account. You should be buying the house. All your friends bought houses a couple years ago, and you're still saving. And it seems like the more you save to buy this house, the more you need to save to buy this house. Because we live in West Asheville, and every, every month or so, the prices go up by $100,000. And so, what are we supposed to do, God? Why can't you provide for me the way that you're providing for them? Where is God while I'm trying to save? Where is God in my finances? Maybe you've been at the same job for many, many years and you're sitting in this job and when you started, you believed there was so much room for mobility and you were going to go somewhere and your managers assured you if you did the right things, you would get there and yet you're still in the same place and you're wondering, where is God here? Why doesn't he provide for me here? I've given so much to this. Maybe you're waiting for a job. Maybe you've put in applications in like 50 to 60 different places and you know you're qualified and you know you're a great worker, but they just can't see it for some reason and you're just waiting desperately for this to happen. Where is God? Why isn't he here? Doesn't he know the desperation of my situation? Why doesn't he show up? Why does he seem so late? Maybe you're waiting for that relationship. For the right person to come along. And it seems like there's just nothing but a whole lot of Mr. Wrongs out there. And Mr. Right doesn't exist. Or that perfect woman that you have been searching for must have only been in a movie. And you're starting to think maybe it's just ever going to only be me. Where is God here? And maybe you're thinking, when is my relationship going to get better? Why is it so hard right now? Why can't we connect? Why are we such different people? When is things going to get better? And all the while... We wait on God. We're desperate for God. But it just feels like he's late. And it feels like all this waiting is ruining your life. And God doesn't do anything about it. You don't even know if he cares anymore. Why is he so late? So I want to share something with you this morning. And then we're going to talk about it for a little while. See, I believe that with God, a waiting season is never a wasted season. Let's unpack this idea a little bit and look into the scripture at a story of a time when God seemed late in John chapter 11 and some people who were pretty upset about it. You know, a few people outside of the disciples uh, are people that scripture talks about as Jesus' close friends or people that he loved and cared about. It's a very small list of people outside of those that he was doing 
ministry with. Now, surely there may have been more. We don't know. We don't get the whole picture in the Gospels. We get a great picture, but not the whole picture. And so there might have been others, but we have to imagine that when people actually do make it into this story, they must have been pretty important in the life of Jesus. And so one such family was uh, three siblings uh, that we know were close with Jesus and that Jesus uh, encountered three separate times in the Gospels. And so we know that they meant something to him. Their names were Mary and Martha and Lazarus, sisters and a brother. Now, one of the early depictions of them that we get in Scripture is a time when Jesus went to go have dinner at their house. See, they lived in a town called Bethany. Bethany was just across the river from Jerusalem. It was only a couple miles away. And so a lot of times people would visit, if they were visiting Jerusalem for a festival or one of the many religious reasons, people would travel if they had family in Bethany. Of course, they would stop in and so... Jesus was in Bethany, and he decided to come see his close friends and have dinner at their house. And maybe you've heard this story before. Preachers often like to talk about Mary and Martha just to remind people that, to stop being so crazy all the time. And I'll tell you why. This, this woman, Martha, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman, and she's a great uh, entertainer. And she had Jesus in her house. And honestly, if, if, if I had Jesus in my house, it would make me a little bit neurotic. Well, that was the case for Martha. She was cooking and cleaning and making sure everything was perfect. She was organizing and all the while, her lazy, good-for-nothing sister, Mary, was just at her house hanging out with Jesus, not helping at all, not doing anything to contribute. Martha became very frustrated at this, which I would as well, and chastised her sister, Mary, in which Jesus just assured her that Mary was doing the right thing, that, hey, I'm here, just spend time with me. Everything doesn't have to be perfect. It's actually a great picture of what he kind of wants in a relationship with you. You don't have to have everything perfect. It doesn't have to be just right. Just come spend time with me. And that was the beginning of this relationship that we see in Scripture between Jesus and this family. And so they had this brother, Lazarus, whom Jesus was very close with. And let's look at the story in John chapter 11 and see what happens. Says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus Lord, the one you love is sick. He had become very sick. That's almost an understatement. This man was dying. Whatever he had in, in, the, in the first century time was a fatal disease. And he was very sick. And the sisters knew how sick that he was. And they were nervous because their brother was sick. But they had a lot of hope because they were friends with Jesus. I mean, Jesus was in their life group. Like, he came to their house. I mean, this is going to be fine. Yes, he's very sick. But we've heard the stories I mean, Jesus heals complete strangers, people he's never met before. Of course, he's going to come through for us. We're his closest friends. He'll show up. He will heal. It will be okay. And they had a lot of faith and they had a lot of hope. And so they believed that everything would turn out the way that they expected it to and the way that they wanted it to. They even sent Jesus a special message. They said, the one you love is sick. Remember Lazarus, Jesus? You love him. Needless to remind you, you see, they had an expectation for Jesus. We have a lot of expectations for Jesus, don't we? We see what he's doing in other people's lives and what he has done over time, and we expect the same thing for ourselves. Because comparison really gets us here. You know, comparison is such a dangerous place to be in, especially when you're in this waiting season. Because there's always somebody that got it a little bit faster than you did or somebody that got it a little bit different than you did and maybe the way that you had wanted it and I think social media really makes this worse I'm not bashing social media I think it's fun and it's fine but I think it also hurts us in this way that when we're in these waiting seasons and you see the pregnancy announcements you see the person's obligatory pose with the sold sign for their house or you see the person's new job or you see them with family members that are in your family missing or sick and it just hurts to see all this and you see that this is the same thing that even without social media Mary and Martha were dealing with in the first century this comparison 
They had heard these stories. Jesus healed the sick. And so that was their expectation for him. They expected that he would heal their brother. And a lot of times when we get into this, we start trying to remind Jesus, remind God of why he should help us, right? Because they said, Jesus, the one you love is sick. Remember, you love him, so maybe you could help him out a little bit. You know, we do the same thing. We're asking God to show up in our lives and we're saying, God, remember me? I am the one that volunteered 100 hours at the shelter last year. Surely you want to show up in my life? Or God, remember me? I give 10% of all of my monies to you, so surely you owe me at least 10% of a healing here, right, God? Isn't that how this works? Or or maybe you, you feel like since you... Uh, perhaps said hello to somebody that you were thinking about ignoring the other day that God should show up in your life and bless you with all of the blessings because of how great you are. And this is what they were doing. And they said, Jesus, the one that you love is sick. Let's keep looking. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He did in fact love Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. What? That doesn't even make any sense, God. Why did you do that? Why would you stay? It just said that you loved these people, but then you said he's going to stay in the same place for two more days. That's not what he should have done. That doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. He should have gone on a plane right then and flew right into Bethany. I imagine it's more expensive. It's probably cheaper to fly into Jerusalem. But it's that important. Jesus, this is your friend. You're going to show up for him, right? Meet my expectations, Jesus. Meet my expectations, Jesus. But Jesus isn't about meeting our expectations. Let's look at verse 4. I skipped it. I tricked you. Verse 4 says, When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son might be glorified through it. This waiting season was truly awful for Mary and Martha. If you've had a close loved one go through terminal illness, you know what it feels like, what it looks like. It is gut-wrenching. It is a pain undescribable, something that your friends don't understand, that other people just cannot understand unless they've gone through it themselves. This waiting season was way worse for Lazarus. He died. I mean, it was very bad for him. He was super sick the whole time, but he had to wait. But none of this was happening because Jesus didn't care. He cared very deeply. We'll see that a little bit later in this passage. It was happening because he had a plan, and his plan was better than their plan. It was happening because his plan was not just for their benefit, but it was for to glorify God. See, this one's a little bit hard to swallow. This is kind of one of the main points here that we need to remember and learn and absorb and think about and meditate on and pray over and try to do our very best to understand because as a, as a race, as humanity, we really kind of believe that it's about us. You know, Whether we don't want to admit it or not, like we really kind of think this whole thing is about me. We feel like the purpose of this life is to glorify me, like the whole point is about me so that my needs might be met, that my joy might be met, that my life might be good. We kind of think, whether or not we want to say it out loud, that it's about us. And that's just not the way that it is. Jesus clarifies here that it doesn't matter whether or not Lazarus is glorified. God is going to be glorified. This life, everything in it, every part of it, everything that we do is to glorify God. That is the purpose of this life, to glorify God. It's not always that easy to understand or swallow, but it's an important truth. And it's one that comes through in this story and that is clear in this story. And even in our hardest moments of waiting, we have to remember that no matter what happens, God will be glorified. He will be. You can rest assured that however difficult your season of waiting may be, that there is a plan in place that will glorify God. 
If you'll depend on him, if you will wait and continue to call on him, then this season can glorify God in your life. And this is so hard because it feels so personal when you feel like you've been forgotten. When you are waiting for what's next, when you are waiting for a miracle, when you are waiting for the next chapter in the plan, when you are waiting on God, it's hard not to feel forgotten. But you are not forgotten. Jesus didn't say, forget about it. He said, let's just wait a couple days. Let's just give it a moment. Let's just wait. Let's sit on this because I've got a better plan and I will be glorified through it. That's a tough notion that God may not be following my timeline because his is better. I like my timeline, God. I think it's pretty great. In 2011, I had uh, been training and, and learning and studying, had been in school, had been preparing, had been praying, had been talking about church planting. That means starting a church from scratch for two years. For two years, I had been getting myself ready to start a church from scratch. It's what I felt like God had called me to do. I felt like that God had told me this is what he wanted me to do with my life. And so in 2011, I got a job opportunity. I was still in the Coast Guard at the time, and the Coast Guard was going to move me to Buffalo, New York. There was a job opening that I was perfect for, that even everybody, even the guy in charge of making that decision said I was perfect for in Buffalo, New York, which was an easy desk job, which would have allowed me at that point to take part in a new, a brand new church that my brother-in-law was starting from scratch that very same month. I would be coming in just a couple months after it started on the ground floor to be on the staff, to be volunteering, to be giving everything that I had to this church plant, to do what God had created and called me to do, to start this church from scratch, to reach the good people of Buffalo, New York. I couldn't have been more excited. I mean, do you know that that feeling when you feel like something is on the horizon, when you feel like a plan is about to come into place, when that new exciting job comes up, or when that new relationship is kind of just beginning, and, 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 and you feel like this is going to be something amazing, and you kind of give yourself to it. My wife and I gave ourselves to Buffalo and to this idea, this church here, and we were so excited to walk into the plans that God had for our life, and of course, you know where I'm going with this, Uh, for no reason whatsoever, uh, out of the blue, a short time before we thought we were going to be going, I got a phone call from the guy that makes those decisions for the Coast Guard that they had gone ahead and assigned the job to somebody else, somebody with less experience, who was less qualified, who made a whole lot less sense. And I lost that job and I lost that future and I just didn't understand it. Why was God making me wait? I knew that he wanted me to start a church. So why wasn't I starting this church? And then I would go the next summer to California and instead of doing what I was called to do, what I wanted to do and starting a brand new church from scratch, I would go to a church that had been started several years ago and that was growing and successful and had done all these different things and had learned all these different lessons. And I would go and serve there for three years before I ever actually started a church. And so it would have been four or five, six years between the time I felt like I was supposed to do this and when I actually did it. And when I did it, it would be here in Asheville. You see, here's what I know is that that waiting season was difficult that it wasn't what I wanted, and it wasn't what felt right, and it didn't make sense. And for four years, kind of didn't feel like it was ever going to happen, the thing that I wanted, the thing that I felt called to, the thing that I desired. And the specific thing that I wanted just dissipated. I would never go to Buffalo. But here's what I learned in four years of waiting. Everything that I know about starting a church. God changed how I understood churches. He changed how I understood family and marriage. He changed the way that I lead. He changed the way that I preach. He changed my heart. You see, your season of waiting has a purpose. A waiting season is never a wasted season. I know waiting for a job, if you're in a hard waiting season right now, may seem silly, like, oh, boo-hoo, you didn't get the job you wanted when you got it. But for some of us, when we're in that place waiting for that job, it feels like the biggest thing that there ever was. Your waiting season is never a wasted season. You see, I believe that God wants to do something in you before he does something through you. God needed to do something in my heart first 
Before I was ready to go into this world of starting churches, of leading a church, God needed to do something in me. I needed to grow as a person and as a leader and as a husband before I could enter into the challenging world of ministry. I just wasn't ready. You may not be either. God doesn't want to do something big in your life before you are ready. You may think that you're ready, but he knows you better than you know you. So in your season of waiting, ask yourself, what is happening in me right now? What is God doing in me right now? We did a series this summer called Untapped. And in the second message of that series, we talked about the waiting and how important it is to take a step back and ask what it is that is growing and changing inside of you during that season. Often the thing that he wants to do in the end is far bigger and far more amazing than the thing you thought you were waiting for in the first place. That was the case for Lazarus. They were waiting on Jesus to heal him. They were waiting on Jesus to do something that he had done before. But he didn't want to do something he had done before. He wanted to do something new. Maybe he wants to do something new in your life. Maybe, just maybe, the thing that he wants to do in your life is far bigger than what you expect. Let's look at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead, and not only is he dead, hope is gone. You see, there was a specific reason, I think, Jesus waited for that fourth day. There was a superstition in that time period and in that part of the world that the spirit of a person would hover over their body for three days after they died. And so there was kind of a small chance that for those first three days, they might come back. Because the spirit was close. But on that fourth day, the spirit went to wherever it was going. And the person's body was simply dead and hope was gone. You see, in Lazarus's case, hope was gone. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. This man was dead. Nobody could have anticipated or expected that he would have ever been anything other than dead. Let's look at the rest of this passage. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Oh man, we want to yell stuff like that at God, don't we? Maybe we do. We know this when waiting season kind of turns into I waited and then it didn't happen season and the thing that we didn't want to happen happened or the thing that we wanted to happen didn't happen and then God was never anywhere, no miracles, he didn't show up, nothing incredible happened and we just want to pound our fists on his chest and say, if you would have been there, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And what she's saying there in verse 24, if you've ever lost someone who's very close to you and the preacher doing the funeral walks up and says, well, they're in a better place. And you're thinking, "Uh uh-huh, sure, a better place. A better place would be at my home. A better place would be with me. A better place would be at my side. A better place? A better place than with me? Do you see the way that I am hurting? A better place? Are you kidding me? That's what Martha felt. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know he will rise again someday. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, 
my brother would not have died. This is the difference in their personalities. And it's the two predominant ways we deal with things when tragedy hits or when the waiting gets to be too long. See, Martha's first reaction is to run to Jesus and pound on his chest and say, if you had been here, he would not have died. But Mary is just broken and hurting. And she runs to Jesus and just crumples at his feet and just says, Lord, where were you? Why didn't you come? Why didn't you come? This is a real moment. Two things I want to notice here. These women were hurting and they were mad at Jesus and they were mad at God and they didn't understand why he was late, but they still had hope and they still had faith. And it is so hard to do this. But did you catch the things that they said? Through their pain, through their anger, but I still believe you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. You are good. I know that you are good, God. You can do anything that you want to do, but I hurt. It is so hard to cling to hope when God seems late, but it makes all the difference. That's one of the points I want us to learn in this whole series as we look at the lives of King David and John the Baptist and Mary and Martha, and we understand that these struggles that they faced are the same struggles that we face, that the pain that they felt is the pain that we feel, that the doubts that they had are the doubts that we have. But despite all that, they still had faith that God is there and He is good. We need to have faith like that when God doesn't make sense. When God doesn't make sense, we have to remember that even if it doesn't make sense to us, that He is there and He is good. The second thing that I would point out is that despite that faith, they were in pain. They did have doubt. They were hurting. They had lost their brother, and they knew that Jesus could have prevented that. They had heard of him doing it for strangers, and they were hurt. I imagine it's even a little more intense than today. You know, when you lose a close loved one, you've heard miraculous stories of healing and that Jesus, you believe God can heal people. And if he didn't, it does feel personal. But this was actually Jesus, flesh and blood, walking around, touching lepers, and their skin became whole. And yet he didn't show up. I imagine that was a unique pain. And Jesus had just told them what he was going to do. He told them he was going to do something amazing, but they didn't hear it. He said, your brother will rise again. And sometimes when God speaks to us, we're too caught up in our own words to hear his. He may be trying to comfort us. He may be trying to show us his plan, give us vision. But when we are just thinking about the way that we want things to go, we miss it. They were too caught up in their grief to hear him. He didn't do what they wanted to do or what they expected him to do. That's the main thing, isn't it? That God doesn't do what we expect him to do. God, you aren't meeting my expectations. When we cry out in anger over waiting and God not making sense and all that accompanies that, isn't that what we're saying? God, you didn't do what I expected you to do. You didn't meet my expectations. See, we have expectations for who God is and what he is supposed to do. And then when he doesn't meet them, we get indignant about it because he should be meeting our expectations because it's about us. Here's something to think about. If God always met your expectations, he would never have the opportunity to exceed them. See, he wanted to do more than what they expected here. So much more. He wanted to do something amazing, something that nobody had ever heard of, but they just kept begging him to do what they expected him to do, and they were furious because of it. But maybe if they would have released that anger a little bit and released that pain and put their expectations aside, they would have heard it when Jesus looked in their eyes and said, your brother will rise again. So what is he saying to you? What is he telling you that he wants to do that is new and that is different, that is exciting that is filled with change. Our expectations for God are always based on our understanding of God. And our understanding of God is so limited. So much smaller than who and what He really is. He sees more than we see. He knows more than we know. And He understands more than we understand. And of course Mary and Martha were distraught. They had seen God heal before and they expected Him to heal. When he didn't, they didn't even think of a resurrection. They had never seen resurrection before. They had heard whispers, maybe rumors, of a girl who seemed dead. And Jesus held her up and she walked 
talked again, but she had only just died if she had died, which meant her spirit was close at hand. So maybe he just made her from very, very sick or, or maybe it was one of those things like in The Princess Bride. He's very nearly dead. <laughs> He's not quite dead and enough fan into his mouth and he'll come alive again. It was superstition. It wasn't real. Nobody expected that a man who had been rotting for four days could ever walk again. But God is not in the business of doing what you expect Him to do. He is God. He spoke and the universe came into being. Do not put limitations on what He can do. Just because you haven't seen God do it, doesn't mean He can't do it. Sometimes the thing that you wanted is not as good as the thing God has planned for you. He could have healed Lazarus. But if he did, I doubt anyone would still be talking about it today. Remember, he never wanted them to hurt or to feel pain or to feel the disappointment of this loss. That's not, not his desire. You know, I actually love the picture of the character of God this next couple of verses gives us. Because, see, Jesus was already troubled by Mary crumpling at his feet and crying. And he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? He asked in verse 34. Come and see, Lord, they replied. In verse 35, it just simply says, my favorite verse in all of the Bible, that Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that Lazarus was about to walk out of that tomb. So why would he cry for him? Not for Lazarus, but for his sisters, for his family, for his friends. See, when you hurt, God hurts. He is not some kid with a magnifying glass burning ants. He feels your pain. He does not want you to hurt. And even when his plan is going to be better than what you had imagined, he does not want you to hurt. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He has been dead for four days. Uh, the King James Version is my favorite. It says, he stinketh. Everything's a little holier when you say eth at the end. He stinketh, Lord. This man is very stinky. He's super dead. He's been dead for a long time. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you just believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I don't know why it was such a loud voice, I imagine, because Lazarus was dead. Dead people don't hear very well. So Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face, looked like the mummy. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go, because he's alive. And nobody saw that coming. <laughs> God did not give them what they expected, but he was glorified. Just because God hasn't shown up yet in your situation and in your life does not mean that he won't. Just because he hasn't given you what you expected doesn't mean he won't give you something better. Sometimes when God seems late, he just has a different plan. Last week we talked about the proverb that says, In their hearts, humans make their plans, but the Lord directs their steps. It's chapter 17. But his, ban his plan is better than our plan. And I know it doesn't always feel better, but his purpose will be served. And in the end, God will be glorified. You know, there's something interesting in, about my Bible here. See, on page 978, Lazarus is dead. I mean, he's just dead. He is dead. There is no hope. He's been dead for four days. God didn't do what we expected him to do, and we are mad at God. But then, just right here on the next page, Lazarus walks out of that tomb. He walks he walks out of the tomb. He is alive again. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody expected it because on page 978, there was no hope. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. 
I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're waiting for. I don't know what it is that you feel like isn't going to happen. But the odds are that you're stuck on that page 978 right now. And that you just can't see what's coming. It's beyond your understanding. It's beyond your scope. It's a, wow, I really knocked at that thing. I got it. My hand motions got too big. It's beyond what you expect. But God wants to do something better on the next page. If you'll just wait for him to turn the page, you will see more than you have ever seen before. The Spirit of God could do something beyond what you have ever asked or imagined, beyond what your expectations could have ever come close to. But right now, you're just on page 978. It's hard to live on page 978 when God feels late. But just because you aren't married now doesn't mean that won't change when you turn the page. Just because your marriage is not good right now doesn't mean that won't change on the next page. Just because your child isn't following Jesus today doesn't mean that he won't be a fully devoted follower of Christ on page 979. I know it's hard and I know it's difficult. And I know that it feels like you've been ignored and that you've been let down. But you have to trust God. The scene for your greatest disappointment could be the setting for God's greatest miracle. Could it be that he wants to do a miracle here? Could it be that he wants to do something fantastic in your life? Maybe he wants to teach you to rely on him in a brand new way. Maybe the only way you're ever going to learn to trust him was by having every other option taken away from you. And now, though it seems like a season of desperation, you are going to see the greatest work he will ever do in your life. What is the thing he wants to do that is beyond your expectations? What is waiting for you on that next page? Maybe you are in that place, in that season, where you are suffering with waiting for a child. I'm with you. But maybe God wants to do something even bigger in your life. Maybe it's adoption. Maybe God doesn't just want to change your life. He wants to change the life of some beautiful child that you will bring into your family. Maybe it's foster care. Maybe he wants you to be an agent of love in a city filled with children. Maybe, maybe God isn't bringing that promotion into your life because there is a better job on the horizon, a better offer on the horizon. Maybe you're not in the right financial place to buy a house now because God doesn't want you to buy that house here. Because God doesn't want you to be in this place forever. Because God has a bigger plan. Because he wants more for your life. Because he knows more for your life. And just because you haven't seen God do it doesn't mean he can't do it. Now, there is another side to this. I know that page 979 doesn't always end in a resurrection. Sometimes we don't get to see the great thing that God is going to do. Sometimes the things that we are waiting for never come. Sometimes the things that we are waiting for, we just keep waiting for. I know how hard that is, but you have to trust and you have to believe that even in those days, God will be glorified through it. And this life is about God being glorified. It's not the best answer. It's not an easy answer. The, the fact of, of all of this, this whole series, is that there is not an easy, marketable answer for every problem that we face. But the comfort I can give you is that God will be glorified. Whatever happens, no matter what, on page 979, Jesus will be glorified. I'm going to pray for us. Father God, we just thank you so much that you are able to do more than we ever asked or imagined, God. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of miracles, that you are a God that is beyond our expectations, that our expectations for you are ill-formed, Father, that what we expect of you is based off what we have experienced, but God, you can do more than we have ever experienced. We believe, Father God, we believe that you will be glorified through these circumstances that you will be glorified through this waiting. And God, we just submit to that. And though we are angry and though we have doubts and though we have questions, Father, we will, we will be like Martha and we will say, I am mad at you, but I trust you. We love you so much, Father. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.